Paul, it's great to have you back on the show here. We're essentially doing part two of our conversation, and today we want to talk about succession planning, which is an issue that has gotten a lot of press here in the past few years in the industry, particularly as the average age of the leader of many of the advisory firms out there or in their 50s or in their 60s. So we've been hearing about this changing of the guard. And so we want to talk about succession planning. I know you and your team have done a lot of work on this over the years. You've got a pretty good framework here for how we should be thinking about succession planning. So excited about having the conversation today. Yeah, me too, Steve. Well, tell me a little bit about some of the context, perhaps. So how should we be thinking about succession planning? How did you and your team decide that this was an area that you really needed to spend some time delving into? Yeah, uh, what we found out in the marketplace was too often people just relied on the general numbers that were kind of out in the ether and use those numbers without a lot of context. Um, and so if you look at uh, a practice or a business, you want to look at it through the same lens that you would if you were purchasing a stock. When I used to be in the business, I would tell my, my uh, clients, you're not buying a stock, you're buying part of a company. And we're gonna look at that company as though you were buying the company. And so why are some multiples higher than others? Well, there's very concrete criteria that we all evaluate looking at companies that actually apply to our own businesses. Uh, whether you're a buyer or a seller, you're looking to optimize price. And so we wanna give a criteria that you can literally go through sequentially and very analytically to determine where on that range of price you should land, whether you're trying to sell your business or prepare it to sell, or whether you're looking to buy a business. Yeah, so I, I think what we'll do then is I'm gonna share some of the data that I've got here in terms of what we're seeing for valuation of advisory firms. And then I'd love for you to go into some detail as you just described there in terms of, okay, if these are some of the ranges and the multiples that we're seeing out there, what are some of the things that advisors can do to actually impact if they're at the higher end of that valuation range or the lower end? And I know you've got a lot of good information on that. So some of the data that I'm seeing here is, let's say that you look at 100% of your revenue and your operating expenses should be somewhere in say the 35 to 40% of revenue range, and that's not including the owner's compensation. So then we would look at owner comp somewhere in the range of 20 to 25% of revenue. Now, one of the things to remember here though, is that when we're doing this kind of valuation model, we've got to make sure that when we're figuring out what the comp of the owner is, that we need to look at what is the market rate for that owner, meaning if you took yourself as the owner out of the picture and you had to hire someone to replace you to do exactly what you were doing. What is the market rate to hire that person to replace you? So as the owner of the firm, maybe you're making a million or 2 million a year, but to replace you, you might only have to pay somebody 500,000. So it's that $500,000 number that we want to put in there for the owner comp in terms of how a buyer is going to evaluate the business. So again, owner comp, maybe 20 to 25% of the revenue. So that leaves us with an EBITDA, earnings before interest taxes, depreciation and amortization of somewhere around 25 to 40%. And now here's where it gets interesting is the multiple that's gonna be placed on your EBITDA number. And you're gonna give us some detail here, Paul, in terms of how we can affect what that multiple is. How can we get to the higher range? But I do wanna share some data here from Tim Welsh of Nexus Strategy. Tim tweeted, tweeted this out back in December. So it's a little bit old. I suspect it's probably not too far off. Although with what the markets are doing here in 2022, maybe the numbers have come down just a little bit, but these are some really high multiples. So he was saying that firms with 500 million-ish in asset center management, we're getting multiples of seven to nine EBITDA. Those in the 1 billion AUM range were pulling down multiples of 13 to 15 times EBITDA. And firms 5 billion or higher were looking at an EBITDA multiple of 17 
10, 19. So very clearly that the larger your firm gets, the higher the multiple that you're going to get. And so I think that's also one reason why we see a lot of this acquisition, merger and acquisition stuff going on in the industry, because they're playing a bit of an arbitrage. So if you're a multi-billion dollar firm and you're getting valued in the marketplace at 15, 16, 17 X, and you're buying a $500 million firm that's only at seven to nine X, well, you're adding some value just by combining them with you. So a little bit of arbitrage going on there. So let me just stop there and see what, what thoughts you may have on that, Paul. Yeah, that's, 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 well, you see that quite frankly, you've seen that in our industry since its inception. Um, you know, the, the more assets, regardless of channel, the higher your percentage take of those assets, right? It's, 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 I always used to, when I would teach this stuff, you know, we were built on a legal model, right? Uh, a legal model compensationally is based on your ability to grow. And so the partners are always the ones that drive the engine of growth. And that's what you see in our industry with the percentages going up as your asset thresholds in, increase. So that is not surprising at all. Um, for those that you know aren't going to run that kind of math, how would those translate, Steve, uh, just as a percentage of assets or revenue, if you were to give a kind of a thumbnail of that? Yeah, I think you could just do the math. And you, what I would do is I would do the the valuation that I just described, coming up with what the EBITDA is and using for the owner comp the market replacement cost of the owner. So then you figure out what your EBITDA is, you put that multiple, some of those different ranges that I just described here that came from Tim. And then you can see, okay, that's my valuation. And then you can see, okay, well, you know, what is that as a percentage of my AUM? So, I mean, I can't give you an exact number, whether it's, you know, 2%, 4%, 5% or whatever of AUM, sure. but I would do that analysis first, then as a check, so to speak, you could, then do that as a percentage of your AUM and see what that shakes out to. But I don't think there's a lot of buyers out there that are looking at it differently than the EBITDA because people Got want it. to know what, what what are your profits and right. are those profits right. going? So, and we'll get into that in terms of how can we affect whether you get to the higher end of that valuation range. Perfect. So uh, why don't we start with uh, a basic framework uh, and then we'll go through each of these kind of concepts uh, when you're looking at a practice, because obviously a practice is far more than uh, revenue, assets, profitability. Um, it's I, I look at it as almost sustainability. There's a sustainability factor. So um, I kind of look at a three-step evaluation. The first step is you want to assess the business as an entity. Uh, and I've got some criteria for that. You then want to assess the, uh, the team, if, you, if it is a team, and oftentimes with these, as you know, the larger enterprises are teams. So you want a way to evaluate the personnel in that particular practice. And then the third variable is the clientele within that practice. And all three of those variables are vital. Um, I'll give you an extreme example. When I was very young in the business, uh, there was a, a gentleman in our office who was doing around a million dollars in, in gross revenue. Um, and this was back in the late 80s. So that was, you know, it's a pretty serious number back then. Uh, but the revenue, about 70% of the revenue came from two people. And they were old people, which I now appreciate that better than I did back then. Um, but it, it, that was a precarious model. And quite frankly, while I was still in the office before I kind of moved into my management career, uh, one of those two had an, a medical incident and went off the grid. And, you know, that was back in the days we used to put out, you know, gross revenue and assets in the office. And this guy went from top of the, you know, one of the top people in the office to virtually nothing in the blink of an eye, because this guy was in the hospital. <laughs> so, so it, you know, knowing the infrastructure of the business is vital. And I, that's where I kind of classify this as sustainability. 
Yeah, absolutely. And you're talking about concentration risk there. And that's something to take a look at your business as well. If you have any single client, now in your case, that was an extreme example. But right. if a, a normal practice, if you have a client that accounts for 5% or 10% of your practice, that's when eyebrows are going to start getting raised here, that that is starting to get to be a high concentration risk. And you better be sure you got a great relationship with that person as well as their beneficiaries in case anything should happen. But, but uh, yeah, that's something certainly to keep in mind. Yeah. So, so if you look at really kind of what's at stake in this decision, um, if you get this right, um, using both your valuation metrics that you articulated, Steve, as well as some of these sustainability concepts, if you get it right, you're going to maximize your ROA and ROI. Um, you're going to have tremendous business continuity, both with the clientele and the team, if it's a large practice. Um, and you're going to uh, have a multi-generational sustainability if the clients are engaged in the right way. Um, and if you get it wrong, it can obviously crush the ROA or ROI because all of a sudden a, a catalytic event can cause all kinds of disruption. Um, and it, it could create a much higher time commitment potentially than you are anticipating. Um, you know, my, my own brother uh, purchased a practice and didn't do as much due diligence as he might should have. And it took probably two to three times more time to get that practice where it needed to be than he had anticipated. So there is that kind of almost time value of money that can come into play if you don't do this kind of deeper diagnostic. Um, it can also throw your own team into some chaos if you don't do your due diligence, especially around the team and the personnel that you might be acquiring. Um, and client attrition can be significant because one of the other variables, and this is something I talk about often, is we often feel like, well, my clients trust me. And if I tell them that I'm going to even retire um, and I like Paul, and so you should transfer your loyalty and trust to Paul. Well, maybe, maybe, but all of your top clients, think of your top 10% of your clients. They are on the radar of every great practitioner in your community. And those practitioners like you ping them periodically. And so they've kind of got a built-in backup plan if anything were to happen to you. And so if you don't give enough of a runway or do the due diligence around the team or the successor, your client could become quickly dissatisfied and raise their hand to that one or two top advisors that have been trying to poach them from you and say, I'm out. So, you know, don't think just because they trust you and like you that they're just gonna go lockstep with you if you don't do that kind of due diligence. Yeah, yeah, clearly you can't just transfer trust from one person to another. You as the longtime advisor, you spend a lot of time building up that trust and it doesn't just automatically transfer to your designated right. succession partners. So certainly uh, clear there. So let's talk about getting your house in order. And this is something that you're gonna wanna do years ahead of time. So if you're anticipating some type of succession plan, you need to be thinking three to five years ahead of time to get all this stuff in order. And so we, we wanna talk about things like business development, your planning capabilities, client service, practice management, and, and, and so on. So take us through some of that, if you would, Paul. Absolutely. So uh, let me establish the metaphor I've been using for 25 years around your practice. So I look at your practice uh, through the metaphorical lens of a house. So your analogy is perfect. Um, that house, that practice has four rooms, the new business development room, the wealth management room, the client service room, and the practice management room. And so you want to evaluate your practice through all four of those lenses. Um, 
So that's the evaluation structure. Um, so for the buyer, you want to go in and really diagnose what's going on in those four rooms. As a seller, you want to make sure that each of those four rooms is operating at top efficiency. Think of it as staging your house, right? When you put your house on the market, you want to make sure that it's everything's operating at best capacity to show well when you have a buyer stroll through your house, your practice. So that's the concept. So there's a, I've got a tool that basically gives you five criteria to look at in each room. So just to give you a couple of examples, um, I'll go through each room and give you one or two or three examples. So in the new business development room, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to look at is a five year growth rate at minimum. But a five year growth rate is usually almost every practice I've ever evaluated has really solid numbers on that five year growth rate. And you wanna look at it through the lens of, is it above the average growth rate at the average growth rate or below the average growth rate? If you wanna slice it further, you can look at it through the lens of organic or inorganic growth. Obviously, you would prefer to have organic growth with accretive clients versus just market action. Unfortunately, the vast majority of practices rise and fall with the markets. And that's why you see these spikes and these de degradations of valuation as the market goes through its gyrations. Um, the other thing you want to look at is both the quality and consistency of client referrals. You wanna look at, okay, on average, how many new clients are you introduced to in an average month or quarter? Where are they coming from and what's the quality? So, and that can be a combination of client referrals. Uh, and in many of the top practices, they're a result of strategic partnership or alliance referrals that they have with people they work with within their marketplace. And you know, some of the top practitioners, especially I used to work with out in LA, uh, you'd have agents that would refer clients. Uh, those could be sports agents, they could be entertainment agents, but if you had a really good relationship with some of them, them they could fuel your business forever. So, so that's, those are two things to look at in new business development. And there's, there's others. Uh, wealth management room. Um, sure. Yeah, let me, let me just jump in here and make an observation about the new business development piece. What I see as well, to your point, on the growth of the practice. So that's definitely something that buyers are going to put a lot of weight on. They want to see, ideally, that you're growing. But it's, it's a bit nuanced in that if you're growing super fast, well above industry average, it's probably okay if you have a lower profit margin because the thinking is going to be that we're reinvesting in the business, we're hiring people ahead of time because we're growing fast. So we're not going to give you a discount because your profit margin is lower or your EBITDA is lower if you've got a really fast growth rate and it looks like that growth rate is sustainable. Conversely, if your growth rate is lower, your profit margins might be higher. So think maybe some trade-offs there. What you don't want to have is a low growth rate, really high profit margin, because what that would probably suggest is you have not reinvested into the business the way that you should. You probably have a lot of big investments that you need to make to get up to current standards, and you've probably just been milking the business for cash flow. And so that's, that's an issue. So these are all examples of things that buyers are going to be looking at when they're trying to value your business. So as the business owner, you've got to think about how do I want to look at all these different variables? What are the ones I want to emphasize or de-emphasize? And again, that's why you want to be doing this three to five years ahead of time to give you some runway to make the adjustments that you need to make so that you can optimize the value of your business. Yeah, that's a great point, Stephen. Again, it takes us back to the original comment we made 
around looking at your business like you would look at a company that you were going to look at purchasing their stock. It's the same concept. We will sacrifice some profitability for rapid growth. But if you're not going to rapidly grow, we expect a lot more profitability, uh, higher dividends, things like that to offset the lack of growth. So that's a very great point. Thank you. Um, so now let's look at the wealth management room. And the concept there is twofold. One is if it's structured properly, it gives you multiple revenue streams rather than singular, and it makes the, the ability to switch much more difficult. So, so the, the, how, you can, how that wealth management room is constructed is vital to the sustainability of the practice. So you know, one of the things we suggest you look at is, for example, what percentage of the clients have completed and implemented a comprehensive wealth management architecture. So you wanna look at, okay, let me see some, you know, your top, you know, 10% of your clients. Let me see the plans. Let me see the implementation structure. How do you know it's been done? How current is it? Um, because again, all of those create multiple revenue streams rather than just tied exclusively to your portfolio management prowess. And it makes it it's sticky, right? It makes it more difficult for that client to unwind all of the things they're doing with you to move to another practitioner. So that's a critical component. Um, how systematized is their portfolio management structure? You know, is there, you know, going in and saying, you know, how do you manage portfolios uh, based on the client's needs and based on objective portfolio management criteria? Let me see the technology you, you use. Let me see the, re the repeatability of your process. Let me see, is it congruent with everything that we know about baseline portfolio management? Because if you're going to, again, absorb practice or try to transfer that practice or sell that practice, you want to have a relatively turnkey structure that's repeatable so that the ease of transition for those clients is not going to be a whipsaw. So that's kind of what we look at on the wealth management side. Those are just two examples. Yeah. And just to add to that as well, and to complement what you're talking about here is a couple ways to look at this. So one is if I'm a seller and I'm trying to maximize or optimize the value of my business, you might have a specialty. For example, you might do a terrific job on estate planning and asset protection, and you work with entrepreneurs, people who have big liquidity events, and you want to make sure that you're protecting their assets and have good estate plans in place. So maybe that's a specialty, but maybe you're really weak on the investment side. So if, if your specialty is say estate planning and asset protection, you might attract a buyer who says, we really need to add that capability. And there can be tremendous synergy if we acquire your firm, because we've got some other firms in our stable that could really benefit from your expertise in that area. So that's a very synergistic complementary fit. The opposite could also be true where you're, like I said, you're really weak on the investment side. So maybe you wanna look for a partner who can really add a tremendous capability on the investment side to complement what you're doing on asset protection and estate planning. So again, all these ways to think about it, all the variables, and I, I love the, the structure that you put in place here, Paul, in terms of how you think about comprehensively all these different areas. And again, the advisor, the owner has to think about all of these moving pieces, which are the ones that I need to adjust, which are the ones I need to emphasize, get better at so that I can optimize this. So it's, it's sort, of, sort of like pieces of a puzzle here that we're trying to figure out. Yeah, Steve, it's funny, uh, you know, the previous podcast we did, we actually kind of talked about that in depth around, you want to have uh, complementary skill sets, but you want to have a congruent philosophical framework. So you've got to agree on the basic direction and framework of the enterprise but you've got to have complementary skill sets so that, that team is accretive to the client and to your revenue structure. So yeah, that, that, that we hit that pretty hard on that previous podcast. That's great. So the third room obviously is the client service room. Um, the first thing I really look at, especially for the high-end enterprises is do you have a manageable number of clients? 
Um, the, the, the top practices that I've evaluated have a scalable business. Um, it's not a business where the only way you grow is to throw more and more and more clients on an increasingly thin infrastructure. So the, 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 the number, the range is the top practitioners normally have between 50 and this 50 and 150 clients or households per relationship manager. So a relationship manager is anyone who's licensed and engaging the client on a regular basis. So that's a, a number to be aware of. If you start seeing, let's say you've got, you're looking at a practice, they've got two principals, but they've got 1500 clients. Well, that needs to be evaluated because you are gonna have some very dissatisfied clients for the most part you're gonna to tend to have a lower level of ROI on those clients. And they could that could be a very time intensive experience for your team to take, to absorb. So, so that's one of the variables. Um, have they done a quantitative and qualitative segmentation of their clients? Do they really know who pays the bills, the degree of difficulty of each client? So you want to ask them right up front, let me see your quantitative and qualitative evaluation of your clients. How do you stratify your clientele? What are the criteria you use to do that? Um, you're going to find that about maybe 70% don't have that. And so then the next question becomes, okay, so if you haven't segmented your business, how do you stratify your service levels to make sure that you're spending the great, greatest amount of time, energy, and focus on those top clients. So those go hand in glove. And normally without segmentation, the service tends to be treating everyone, as I like to say, equally poorly. So take a look at that, see what they've got. And if they do have a segmentation structure, then ask them, okay, then how does that drive your servicing model to those clients? That's things like call structure, meeting structure, recognition model, um, engaging you know, the panoply of uh, things your firm offers. So how does that segmentation drive your engagement model? Yeah, this is so good. The whole client service piece, because you often hear advisors say, well, we're growing because we provide such great service. Okay, sure. And <laughs> I've got I've got several coaching clients that I'm working with right now. And the first point that you are making here is about having a manageable number of clients that each advisor is working with. Well, for these advisors that I'm working with, they've got way too many clients that they personally are working with. And so we're putting aggressive growth plans in place. And one of the first things that we need to do is we need to free up capacity. We need to figure out how can you work with fewer people and work with the people who are best suited for you in terms of their complexity that match the skills that you have to offer. Right. But we need to make sure that you're working with the right people and that you've got the capacity to grow. So we've got several different levers that we can pull in terms of how can we reduce each advisor's capacity to make sure that they're working with the right number of people. And then, you know, what's the mix between how much time do I want to spend working with clients versus how much time do I want to spend working on the business? You know, that old saying, work on the business instead of in the business. So right. we've got to get that, get that mix right. So buyers are going to be looking at, if I buy your firm, are you adding capacity to bring on new business or do we just need to be hiring more advisors because you're already right fully booked. So that I think is going to be a key piece. And then you also talked about the uh, segmenting the clients and having a defined service. I call it a service matrix in terms of who gets what kind of service. Uh, I see a lot of advisors, even though that's talked about in the industry for decades, a lot of advisors still don't have a formalized process to do that. And, and right. I've seen how powerful it is when you are systematic, when you're consistent in delivering the right level of service to the right kind of client. 
and it's it's super powerful. I think a lot of people say that they do, but I think there's a lot more people that don't actually do what they say. Yeah, I and I found that when I was doing all that consulting work back in the day, Steve, when we were kind of shoulder to shoulder back in the old days. And you're right. I, I always say, check under the hood. You know, it, it sounds good on the showroom. You know, check under the hood. And to your point about number of clients, I, I used to tell my the people I was working with back in the day, if you're not outgrowing some of your clients, you're not growing, right? If you're still working with the same type of client you did 10 years ago, you're not evolving. You're not growing. You, by definition, should be attracting a whole nother level of client in terms of, to your point, complexity, sophistication, assets, you know, all of those variables today than you did 10 years ago. And if you're not, then we got a whole nother range of problems. But if you're a top practitioner, you will outgrow clients that you brought in 10, 15, 20 years ago. And so the question becomes, what do you do with those clients? And there's a whole range of options that doesn't harm the client, but to your point, frees up your capacity to continue to move upstream. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's such a good point about you as the advisor. If you're growing, you should be outgrowing your clients. And I see this a lot as well with the advisors that I work with. They get started in the business and they're happy to have a $500,000 relationship. But now they're like, I don't get excited unless it's $5 million. And, and I don't want that to sound derogatory toward folks that, that have lesser assets. That's not what I'm saying at all. The key is we've got to match the advisor's skill set and experience to the client that can benefit the most from that. And folks that have less complicated situations, there's other advisors and there's other business models that are structured to really provide them with the level of service that most specifically meets the needs that they have at that level. So that I think is an important point about matching the advisor and the client so that there's the right fit in terms of the skills that can be delivered and the services that are needed for that client. Yes, yeah, Steve, one of the things that I, I actually, this actually happened in real life uh, probably 20 years ago. Um, I had a guy come up to me and he, and he's, you know, when I was kind of younger in the business doing the kind of work we do. And he said, look, man, I've been in the business 25 years. What are you going to tell me that I don't already know? And I said, um, I have one question. Is the 25 years cumulative? And he kind of went, what? I said, is it cumulative? He goes, what are you talking about? I said, well, I, I meet a lot of people that, you know, they have 25 years in the business, but what they really have is they have the first year or so repeated 25 times. So is it cumulative? Right, <laughs> and you exactly. Tell, his brain kind of went, like, <laughs> so, yeah. so that's, you know, to your point, you know, you get, you got to evolve and you want to take care of people. That's why we got in this business. But I always said, you want to take care of your clients, but it doesn't have to be you taking care of them. If you are evolving and you are capable of working with clients with multiple millions of assets because of the degree of sophistication, credentialing experience that you have, for you to work with a small account defined by whatever that is, I used to joke, it's like taking a bazooka on a rabbit hunt. It's way too much firepower <laughs> to hunt rabbits with, okay? so make sure that your team is properly allocated to their level of competency to the clients that need that level of competency. So, and then the final room, Steve, is the practice management room. Um, and the first thing I look at there uh, is percentage of recurring revenue. Um, and this is something that, you know, we've been looking at in our industry for decades. Um, you know, it's something that, we all know that if I can build a recurring revenue base, I don't wake up every January 1st unemployed. Uh, so, and there's a huge, should be a huge multiple for that type of revenue versus a more transactional revenue. Um, and, it's just, and it's so funny now to look at industry kind of writ large catching onto that. 
if you look at Apple Computer as an example, I mean, forever, they were manufacturing products and they were totally dependent on that product cycle. And all of a sudden they were like, wait a minute, we, we can, if we do an app store and we uh, have a cloud service and we you know, do Apple TV, all of a sudden everything Apple's doing is trying to create recurring revenue. And they're a manufacturing company really at the end of it. So everyone's caught on to that. Um, let's not forget that as part of the variable when you're evaluating your your the business that you're either buying or that you're trying to create. And that's where your whole idea of three to five years, I would say that's minimum three to five years. Because for those of you, you want to have time to create what's going to give you the optimal revenue to, to get the highest price you can for your practice. Uh, the second thing I look at is the tech infrastructure. Um, you know, the old joke of the, you know, the senior advisor getting up there and saying, you know, I'm kind of a dinosaur. I don't really do, you know, this and that in the tech field. You know, that was funny 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago. It's no longer funny. It's, it borders on sad um, because there's so much that tech can do <clears throat> to have recurring, you know, we talk about recurring revenue. Uh, like we talked on the client service side, what about recurring client engagement structure? How do you ensure that happens in a predictable way, in a meaningful way? You automate it technologically to make sure the trains run on time. Um, how, how well do you use your CRM? Because I still see a lot of practitioners and I'm like, let me see what, open your CRM. Okay, walk me through how this keeps your team integrated around your whole service and engagement model. And they're like, I can show you the calendar, click. <laughs> it's like, okay, so we're not leveraging a true CRM. Um, I, I still see practitioners, you know, rather than having a shared task management structure with demarcation points and dates and times and responsibilities and triggers, I still see, well, yeah, when they want me to do something, they see me an email. Your task management's an email that goes out to somebody in the office. How do you follow up? How do you make sure it's done? What's the time frame? How does it trigger? So, so tech infrastructure is vital to a highly efficient practice. And finally, accretive roles and responsibilities. I always want to know who does what and why do they do it? Why them, not someone else? So there needs to be a thoughtful deployment of your team's personnel to play to their respective strengths, whether they're engaging your practice and its infrastructure or your clients and their needs. Oh, great. Well, I think that's a good segue here into this uh, part two or step two here, which is the personnel assessment. So how should we be thinking about our team and making sure that we've got the team in place and optimized for the best price year in succession. Yeah, so that actually, Steve, we hit that in depth on our previous podcast around um, accretive roles and responsibilities and the templates that we gave there. So there's a vast amount of uh, information on that previous podcast. Um, I don't know how you've got that titled, but that's the one I would reference them to go through that in depth. Okay, great. Well, we will refer back to that then in the show notes and you can simply go to stevesandusky.com and you can get access to that. Of course, subscribe to the podcast and you'll have access to it as well. Well, then I think the final one here, Paul, is um, assessing your clientele. So tell us about that. Yeah, um, so the clientele, there's really, a, it's a two-step process. You want to first define your ideal client, and that's a whole range of potential issues like demographics, what are their primary challenges, what's the minimum asset threshold, is it a particular niche or niche markets, um, you know, all of those types of variables. So what is that ideal client, whether you're looking to buy a practice, does that demographic and structure fit your particular team or you're looking to sell a practice and how defined is that, how repeatable is that and how transferable is that? 
So you want to look at step one is to find that ideal client and then map that ideal client to the practice that you're trying to, you're looking at purchasing. Um, step two is, is, is that mapping pra uh, process. So you want to map your practice your perspect, uh, and the perspective practice. So if you look at your practice, what are all the things you do currently within your practice in all these areas we just talked about? And what is the practice you're looking to bring on board? And depending on whether you're buying it outright or merging it, there's different variables you want to assess. If you're buying it outright, you want a lot of it transferable. You want it to look very similar. If you're merging with it, you can, to your point earlier, have complementary capabilities and structures so that you end up with a one plus one equals two. So that, uh, and we again, we've got tools and, and, and structure to help with that assessment. Um, and we actually create a scoring system um, where we look at all these variables and depending on how well this, that particular variable is structured, they can get a score from one on the low end to four on the high end. And so what you're gonna look for is the highest potential score across these variables. And so that gives you a very kind of quantitative way to compare practices if you're looking at more than one practice, how do they stack up? Depending on the score, it can then influence the, the percentage you're willing to pay for that particular practice, because it'll depend on how much work needs to be done to get it where you need it. So, so that assessment, and you can use that on your own practice to see where your weaknesses are, your gaps might be, so that you can shore those up over the next three to five years to kind of get your practice ready for sale or merger. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned the point about, in some cases as a buyer, we're looking to acquire other firms that look very similar to ours because we know how to deal with those people. We can slot them right into our systems and our planning processes and everything's pretty simple. On the other hand, like you said, there may be times when we as a buyer are looking to add to our capability. And so we want to look for someone who does not match what we're doing right now, because we're trying to add that to offer a broader range of skills and, and uh, opportunities to the folks that we work with. So again, all gets back to your strategy. What are you trying to accomplish? And that's why you have to be so thoughtful as you go through and build your, either as a buyer or as a seller, you have to really think through this. And I know we've been saying three to five years, you're right. It really should be at least five years, you know, five right. to seven, five to eight years. You should be thinking ahead of time because there's so many things that we need to be doing here and we want to make sure that we get it right. So, uh, well, good. Uh, let's, if we have some, if you have some time here, I'd love to talk about the communication process. And I hear this a lot from the advisors that I work with on a coaching basis is, okay, we're doing a succession plan or we're selling or we're buying. How do we actually communicate this? to our clients so that we don't get scared. I know you touched on this uh, just a little bit at the beginning of the conversation, but what thoughts do you have on how do we communicate this? Yeah, so the, the key in, in communication is, is really to me, more, it's more important the integration, even more so than the communication. So that's where the three to five years comes into play. You don't want to buy a practice or much less sell your practice, and six months later, you're done. Um, because to our point at the beginning of this podcast, it takes time to transfer loyalty and affinity to another person. So, and, and that's true with anything. If you think about your closest friendships, Steve, they're, they're usually years in the making, right? You don't meet someone and three months later, it's like, oh, this is my best friend. Well, and, and if, if they are, then that's sad. <laughs> so, um, which means you have no other friends. So, so you, you really do wanna give yourself time to integrate that practice and person into your team 
seamlessly. And so that's where, again, we talked about in the first podcast, you want to make sure that that practitioner or practitioners brings some level of expertise that you can bring over and help begin helping them transition those clients into things you can bring that they don't potentially do and vice versa so that this integration happens so that in three to five years when that person is ready to retire you've already built a level of trust affinity and and quite frankly predictability within those relationships and the new t- and the team you've constructed so whether whether you're looking to buy sell or integrate they all have to be integrated as part of the process so that way the conversations don't have to be a one and done and quite frankly the odds of that succeeding are slim it becomes a natural part of the relationship structure with those new clients as they're introduced to the team and the new capabilities that that team brings to bear. So that's that to me is the important conversation is the integration phase. And then those conversations will happen nicely and organically in the course of doing business throughout that three to five years. So when the pass off occurs, it's seamless. Excellent. All right, Paul, well, anything else that you wanna add here as it relates to succession planning that we haven't touched on yet? No, I think we've covered a a good range of variables. and that, I think that's the important thing is, you, you, again, you don't want to just go in with the basic, here's the industry average, I'll pay that. Um, you want all these other variables because these variables are, frankly, even more important. I mean, obviously, you want to buy at the right price. But you definitely don't want to either overpay for poor structure or underpay for great structure, right, or undersell. In, this, in most cases for a great structure. Know what you're buying, know what you're selling, know what the value is, and know what you have that's accreted to that value. Yeah, and one final comment that I wanna make is that your practice, your business doesn't have to be for sale, but it must be saleable. And what I like about that is if you always keep in mind that my business must be saleable, then that's going to force you as the business owner to do the hard work, to put everything in place so that if need be at a moment's notice, you could sell the business because, and I'm going to contradict myself here. We've been talking about three to five years or more than five years. You need to be preparing ahead of time. Well, if you're just doing it all along, then you're going to have a much lower bar to walk over to make your business ready for sale. If you've always been prepping it from day one, that I could sell this someday. So I think that's just a mindset to yeah. think about as the owner is like, I want my business to be saleable on a moment's notice. Not that I'm going to, but that will help me be a better leader, a better business owner. So doing that, I think is a good way to think about this as well. Well, and ironically, Steve, by doing that, you increase your revenue today, right? Exactly. You increase yeah. <laughs> your ROI today. So so the, the beauty of this is y- you don't have to wait for the sale to reap the benefits of this structure. Right, exactly. All right, Paul, well, I think we will wrap it there. Appreciate you being part of this two-part series here on the Between Now and Success podcast. And uh, any any place you wanna send folks if they wanna learn more here about what, what you do, what we're they talking about? They can reach out to me. Uh, the Probably the easiest way is just text me, uh, 214-883-3944. And I'm happy to have a quick conversation and and get you pointed in the right direction. Excellent. All right. Well, Paul, appreciate it. It's been great to catch up with you here on these two episodes and uh, take care. All the best to you. Great. Thanks, Steve. It's been a pleasure.